So hello everyone, it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker of this IOS seminar, Dr. Sasha Niatik from Mount Sinai School of Medicine. Sasha is going to talk to us about uh, uh, inflammatory cytokine and the uh, COV-20 body response and how uh, these responses predict severity and survival in patients with COVID-19. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce Sasha, who I've known now for uh, more than five years when we recruited him uh, at Sanai to lead our immune monitoring center and, and as a, a, an associate professor of immunology. Uh, Dr. Sasha Niatik did his PhD in France uh, with the famous uh, immunologist Gérard Gillier in Institut Cochin. After that, he did his postdoc with Lloyd Hoyt. So for those who don't know Lloyd Hoyt, Lloyd Hoyt is really uh, one of the greatest leaders of uh, cancer immunology. He really believed that uh, um, uh, it is, it's possible to recognize a tumor cell. It is possible to identify tumor antigen that could be recognized and, and killed by, by the immune system. Unfortunately, he died before the great success of uh, the checkpoint blockade. He would have been, he would have loved to to, to see how, you know, the, how how much he was right. Uh, so Sasha did his postdoc with Lloyd Hoyt, and after that, Lloyd Hoyt recruited him at MSKCC, first at the, at the, uh, at the Ludwig um, Immunology Research Center, which is really a, a, a center at MSK that really championed uh, cancer immunology. Sasha then ranked through uh, uh, progressed through the rank and became the director of an immune monitoring uh, platform at the Ludwig Research Center at MSK and uh, for many years. And there he really contributed to defining, in fact, several principles of tumor immunosurveillance and tumor recognition. And um, we were quite fortunate to recruit him at Sinai to also co-lead with me, in fact, the immune monitoring platform, uh, I think five years ago. Uh, he is now uh, an associate professor in hematology and oncology. I mean, soon, I think, professor of, uh, 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 of uh, hematology and oncology at, at Mount Sinai School of Medicine at the Tisch Cancer Institute and the Precision Immunology Institute. And together, we co-lead this immune monitoring platform. So Sasha is really a great expert in antigen-specific immunity. And what's so extraordinary is that he has this combined expertise in both measuring antigen-specific T cells and B cell responses. So when um, this COVID pandemic started, he really stepped up to really use all the tools that he had developed uh, to measure cancer immune responses and, and really uh, redeploy them to study COVID-19 uh, patients. And I think he has generated the body of work that he's going to present today that is really getting us closer to understand pathophysiology of COVID-19. I'm very proud of the data that he's going to share with you today. There is still a lot to come, uh, but uh, I hope you will uh, really enjoy this, uh, uh, really the, the uh, the, the data that he will that he's going to present, but also his interpretation of what's really uh, is associated or lead to COVID-19 severity and potentially uh, uh, and, and compromise uh, survival in patients infected with COVID-2. So Sasha, welcome to um, uh, the IUIS webinar series. I'm going to now mute myself. So all the uh, uh, audience, please, uh, if you have questions, write them in this Q&A, I think, tools that you have. And at the end, I will then select, hopefully be able to select all the questions. And if not, I will select those that are uh, uh, that share a common team, and I will ask Sasha to address them. So welcome, Sasha. Thank you so much, Miriam. This was a wonderful introduction, and I also thank the IUIS for the uh, opportunity to, to talk today. And so, indeed, this is actually a group effort uh, with Miriam very much uh, at the center of it as well, uh, as it uh, indeed uh, leverages our platform that uh, we've built here together over actually almost seven years by now already. And so, uh, the um, uh, effort really resides within this human immune monitoring center that I co-lead with Miriam. And we're basically a platform that has a lot of cutting edge, te cutting -edge technologies and lots of technical expertise in assay development, as well as uh, in expertise in human immunology. 
And we're here to really like map uh, tissues and uh, samples from human uh, uh, subjects that are part of immunotherapies with a variety of diseases. So my own specialty, as Miriam mentioned, is cancer immunology and trying to understand responses to immunotherapy in, in various cancer patients. But we also have a lot of interest in inflammatory bowel disease, also in other viral immunity like dengue and others. And so we're quite poised here with all the infrastructure in place to really look at samples from specimens once COVID hit New York, which was the first epicenter of the uh, epidemic within uh, the United States. And so our goal was really to build a collection of specimens, but also to use our assays as much as possible within the clinic to identify immune correlates of the disease severity that we see in these patients, and hopefully to guide new uh, rationale-based immunotherapy strategies as well. And so uh, it's also very important to mention Sunhi Kim Schultz and Adi Rahman, who are also our facility director and technology development director, respectively. And along with our team of 20 to 25 people who really worked uh, uh, together as part of uh, many other consortia we already have, but here really put all their focus on uh, COVID-19. So I will uh, sp split the talk into uh, two parts. The first one will be more about uh, cytokine responses to COVID and the uh, last part will be about antibody responses as well. But we started uh, early on with the idea that cytokines may be really important to and understand and measure during COVID-19 based on early work that was coming from China and Italy as well, where patients who were admitted in the hospital with COVID, there's such a big heterogeneity of patients and their severity that it was quite hard to understand how this could be simply due to the same virus and whether the virus itself was the one that causes the severity and death versus potentially a more inflammation response that came as a result of the virus and that may be more differentiating patients and that could be causing this hyperinflammatory disease that we're seeing that almost uh, goes beyond just the virus itself and seems to be sustained over a long period of time. And there were also preliminary work showing, you know, cytokine blockades like anti-IL-6 could potentially have some beneficial effects. And so very early on when we started seeing that uh, more and more cases were coming to the New York area. Uh, Miriam and I decided that uh, together with Sung Hee and our HMC decided that we should try to put in place a test to measure cytokines very rapidly. And we brainstormed about which cytokine to use and what platform to use. And we set uh, ourselves on four cytokines, IL-6, IL-8, TNF-alpha, and IL-1-beta, because they were all shown to be involved in pathogenic inflammation in other diseases. And also, they all had potentially actionable uh, drugs against them, such as anti-IL-6 anti receptor that were either FDA approved or that are currently in clinical trials where we could potentially could have reagents to try to counteract them. And the goal was to see like what does the inflammatory cytokine profile looks in the COVID patient? Can we use those cytokines to maybe assess their prognostic value in relation to other factors? and uh, to known severity metrics and final outcome of these patients. And uh, potentially also we were hoping that this could be used to assess uh, how to treat uh, with drugs that modulate these cytokines. And so we uh, quickly decided to deploy this uh, instrument called ELA, which is basically a type of automated uh, microfluidics ELISA platform that uses chips where you can at uh, the same time, analyze up to 16 samples on these cartridges. And they have four analytes that are tested independently in triplicates. And we decided, as I mentioned, those four cytokine, IL-6, IL-8, IL-1, beta, and TNF-alpha. But the important thing is that it's very reproducible and the uh, results can be obtained within three hours. And so because of that, we, uh, this, we contacted early on the pathology department here to transfer it from our immune monitoring center to them because they had the capacity potentially to test many more patients and to have it within the CLIA environment, which is in the United States, the way to have this test uh, done uh, uh, through the system where you order a test clinically rather than just a research assay grade test. And so we were lucky enough to obtain very quickly uh, 
this emergency use approval from the Department of Health in the New York State, uh, in, the, in the state of New York, and we were able to put this machine as part of the EPIC ordering, which is the system that clinicians used when they see a patient. So whenever a patient was suspected to have COVID, they could just order the test, which allowed us to get a huge number of results and information in real time over a very short period. So first, I just have a few slides to show that, you know, we uh, were uh, comfortable enough with this instrument because we had previously compared it to other methodologies, such as, um, for example, here on the left, IL-6, comparing uh, LabCorp, which is the clinical IL-6 measurement, to ELA versus also O-Link, which is another platform that I mentioned a bit later with ELA, and we see that there's great correlation. Most importantly, there's huge reproducibility uh, over different lots, over time, intra and interassay. Everything's done in triplicate, as I mentioned, and the CVs are re really remarkable and with a very high dynamic range, like down to less than four picogram per ml for some of the cytokines can be re repeatedly measured. And the reason we had this experience was really thanks to a collaboration with our cancer immunology department, in particular Samir Barak in multiple myeloma, where uh, measuring cytokine is an important thing in order to determine whether patients may be undergoing what's called cytokine release syndrome. So when patients are treated with immunotherapies, in particular CAR T cells or some bispecific, some of them develop these huge cytokine storms that you can measure and that can be really deadly. And so they have to know when these cytokines appear and immediately act on them with anti-cytokine antibodies such as anti-IL-6 tocilizumab. And so we had already... Um, use this instrument as a research grade in these patients to determine what are the ranges of cytokine that we see in patients without the CRS versus those that have active CRS. And we could see that in general, uh, healthy people were around under 30 picogram per ml for IL-6, IL-8, and TNF-alpha, but there was a hugely significant difference when patients were undergoing CRS. So we thought this was a good assay to use now for COVID. And we, uh, as I said, put it in the clinic. And so within a month period, starting from March 20th till April 21st or so, uh, we were able to accrue 1,484 patients. So 1,484 patients that had a test ordered uh, for this cytokines. And this is their characteristics. Uh, the vast majority of them, 90% uh, were SARS-CoV-2 positive with a median age of uh, 63. Uh, there's a preponderance of male, which has been shown for COVID to be uh, uh, more common. Uh, the population was uh, in majority Hispanic and African-American, which shows that you know this virus does have a tendency to uh, unfortunately affect uh, these populations more often, but it, it also shows where we are located in New York, which is East Harlem, that also is a catchment area around us that has many more of these populations as well, and therefore uh, representative of our of our area too. Uh, patients uh, were 40% uh, obese, which is quite high for New York, even though it's in line with the rest of the United States. Uh, and they had a lot of comorbidities, including hypertension, diabetes, and many others not shown here. And uh, as I said, like the majority of them uh, had uh, SARS-CoV-2 detection when they were ordered. And those that had the uh, uh, PCR also had, uh, for some of them, an antibody test that was positive. And so uh, we, I will uh, go over the severity and uh, other factors later on, but we really decided to focus only on the PCR positive patients in the first place. And so we used these 1,400 uh, specimens uh, to analyze the cytokine levels and compare them to our previously uh, used uh, controls, such as uh, CAR T cell treated cancer patients with and without cytokine release syndrome, as well as uh, some healthy donors. And what we were surprised to see is that almost everyone uh, from the COVID infection cohort had elevated IL-6 uh, at all the measurements. Uh, in general, the measurement was ordered just at one day upon admission to the hospital. So the median time from when the test was done from the moment that the patient was admitted was 1.1 day. Um, a subset of patients had repeated measurements, but within those patients that uh, we tested cytokines, we could see that early on, as soon as they enter the hospital, their cytokines are abnormally high for both IL-6, uh, all IL-6, IL-8, TNF-alpha. It wasn't as clear, unfortunately, for IL-1-beta, where we were a little disappointed to see very low levels. But when we went back to the literature, we saw that this is actually 
not so unexpected, unfortunately, where R1 uh, products in general tend to be very uh, low in circulation, even within the highest inflammatory setting and are probably more acting locally. So this was a little bit of a, a disappointment because this was the one cytokine we had not tested prior in the cancer setting, but at least we could see that for all the other cytokines, if you compare the orange uh, dot plots with the blue or the black, they're clearly much higher and they're more in line with the um, cytokine release levels that's seen in uh, uh, CRS of immunotherapy in red. Uh, what was interesting, though, if you compare what's seen in the cytokine release syndrome of cancer patients versus the cytokines released in COVID, is that the uh, cytokines were not as coordinated in uh, COVID versus CRS. So this is a correlation plot showing that uh, if you expect IL-6 to be high, you also look at IL-8 to be high, and the higher it is, the bluer it should be. And what you can see is that in CRS, most of these cytokines tend to co-occur together, while in COVID, uh, there's a bit of uh, independence, which was quite interesting for us to think that maybe each cytokine has a different effect uh, on the uh, on the pathogenicity of this virus and could be potentially independently also useful or predictive. And one thing that was interesting to observe as well is that if we separate those patients who were PCR negative for CoV-2 versus the positive ones, we clearly see that it's important to have the virus in order to see the high cytokine signature. When you compare it to the PCR negatives, there's clearly much less, even though some of those negatives may be false negatives because we could see that a few of them, at least that we tested antibodies in, uh, for, had actually the presence of antibodies. So it's possible that they, they were just uh, not detected, but they were positive. But still, we decided to exclude them from every further study just to not have this uh, this uh, question mark. So everything was done from now on on the uh, 1300 or so patients who were SARS-CoV-2 positive. And so based on uh, the distribution of these cytokines in the COVID patients, we decided to use cutoffs uh, close to the median within the COVID patient because since everyone was high for IL-6, it didn't really make sense for us to say if you're above the cutoff based on the on the myeloma patients, you should be uh, considered high for IL-6. So instead, we used the value close to the median for each of the cytokines and decided 70 picogram per ml for high versus low in IL-6, uh, 50 for IL-8. It was only for TNF, which had more overlap with the, the negative patients that we decide on, on a slightly higher than median cutoff of 35 and only 0.5 picogram per ml for IL-1 data. And so from now on, we will look at how this uh, is related to other metrics. So first we checked what's the association of each cytokine with demographics. And uh, interestingly, uh, only IL-6 was really correlated with uh, sex and uh, it was seen as higher in males or lower in females, depending on how you look at it. While IL-8 and TNF-alpha really didn't show much of a difference. So already we see that not all cytokines have the same profile uh, uh, in all the patients. Uh, age was by far the most critical factor determining the levels of this cytokine. And so if uh, older you are, the more inflammation you get, the more cytokine you can measure. And this was true for IL-6, IL-8, and TNF-alpha. Uh, surprisingly, obesity, body, ma body mass index, as well as uh, race and ethnicity were not huge factors. And so all this was confirmed first uh, when you see the stars, this was univariate analysis. But when we also applied a multiple adjustment, uh, multiple correction adjustment for multivariate analysis, and what's left with the yellow highlights is still considered significant after adjustment. Next, we asked if there's any association of the cytokine with comorbidities and uh, smoking. And so we saw that uh, TNF alpha in particular was very upregulated in a variety of diseases, including hypertension. IL and uh, diabetes uh, and kidney disease or heart failure, while IL-6 was mostly unchanged, surprisingly, by this disease except uh, atrial fibrillation. And uh, IL-8, uh, TNF, alpha were really confirmed to be significantly higher only in kidney disease after adjustment, meaning that all the other associations were probably more due to collinearity uh, and co-expression of some of these diseases in the patients and basically were eclipsed after multiple correction. So we couldn't see any association with uh, uh, other uh, comorbidities like COPD, HIV, sleep apnea, or cancer, even though cancer was 12% of our population here. Uh, 
And um, overall, we saw that uh, there is independ there's independence of uh, cytokines for a lot of those comorbidities except kidney disease and, as I mentioned, age and sex. So what is the predictive value of these cytokines for survival? We looked at it first independently and then as part of a model that includes all these uh, uh, comorbidities and demographics where we adjusted. And after adjustment for all these uh, things like sex, age, and all the comorbidities that we can measure, the variables that remain significantly associated with worse survival was if you had high IL-6, high IL-8, or high TNF-alpha. So having either uh, one of those above the cutoff that I defined earlier, even though this cutoff can be, uh, it's not a strict uh, one, you can probably move on each side further up and down and you still see this effect because we confirmed this data using a cont continuous variable uh, analysis. But we still thought that for clinical use, it may be more useful to define, you know, what's high versus low. And so based on this particular cutoff, that's where we saw very strongly significantly uh, associated worse survival if the cytokines were high. Uh, IL-1 beta was on the edge of significance, but didn't really make it. So this was really uh, interesting to us that just cytokine alone uh, was truly uh, associated with uh, a higher rate of death. And we were wondering, is this something that we could have predicted by other severity markers that are usually used to define uh, uh, you know, patients with more severe disease? So we looked at the association of these cytokines with common markers of severity, such as fever, level of oxygen saturation, hypoxia, in other words, uh, CRP levels in the blood, D-dimer and ferritin that are known to be all associated with high inflammation that are commonly ordered as part of the clinical tests uh, in these patients. And so not surprisingly, we saw that uh, many of these cytokines followed uh, uh, a similar trend where the more severe patients, meaning the higher fever, the higher hypoxia, the higher CRP and D-dimer, the more IL-6 and IL-8 and TNF-alpha you could uh, determine, even though TNF-alpha wasn't really associated with all of those. It was mostly with some of the inflammation marker, but not as much, for example, for oxygen saturation of fever. And after adjustment, again, with multiple variates, the only one that remained was really IL-6 and IL-8. So is it really important or could we get away with just measuring uh, CRP and D-dimer instead of IL-6 and IL-8? Does, really, does it add anything to measure those cytokines? So we asked also before doing that whether there's association between the cytokine and uh, severity of disease. And severity was determined based on the scale that the pathologist and uh, infectious disease specialist, um, sorry, not pathologist, pulmonologist and infectious disease specialist at Mount Sinai decided based on use of uh, oxygenation, whether you need to have uh, uh, masks like rebreather masks and uh, supplemental oxygenation or ventilation mechanically, whether you had pneumonia on imaging, use of vasopress or inotropins, as well as uh, markers of end organ damage. And we basically had three major categories. The ones who were moderate, there were basically almost no mild disease because these don't require hospitalization usually. So within the patients hospitalized, patients who were moderate without need for oxygen or uh, end organ damage markers, those that were severe without uh, end organ damage but had the need for oxygen supplementation, and the ones who were severe together with the end organ damage. And what we saw is that there was a clear, um, huge difference in cytokine levels with increasing severity. So the higher uh, the IL-6, the higher the severity, the more IL-6 and IL-8 and TNF-alpha could, could be detected. Even though, as you can see, TNF-alpha actually mostly distinguished uh, the end organ damage versus the severe, uh, more so than between severe and moderate. So as I mentioned, uh, there's a lot of collinearity between these uh, different markers. And here is a correlation plot where we look at all the measurements we had from the clinic, all the labs and vitals compared to our cytokines. And this is a, basically a clustering of uh, cytokines where you can, I don't know if you can see my mouse, probably not, but IL-6 and IL-8 in the big graph on the right is uh, somewhere in the first third of the plot and is associated together with other markers like ferritin, D-dimer, uh, and CRP, while TNF-alpha is on the very top associated with organ damage markers like creatinine and uh, kidney damage like amine gap, uric acid. And so we can see that not all cytokines belong to the same categories, but are they really independent of each other? 
And so now we used these cytokines all together in the model and did what's called a backward selection, where we took the most informative uh, markers from the previous plot in terms of their association with survival and uh, one by one removed them until we saw what remains still important. And here on the top is the list of the various uh, adjustments that we made, uh, including, as I mentioned, the four cytokines that we measure, but also demographics, comorbidities, and things like uh, severity markers, such as the severity scoring itself, uh, based on the hypoxia and uh, ILT levels, the oxygen saturation, D-dimer, uh, albumin, calcium, and others. And when we did that, we basically maintained the uh, here in this competing risk model where we uh, look at uh, patient uh, cumulative incidence of death, uh, patients with high IL-6 and TNF-alpha still remained independently prognostic of worse survival. So if you had a high IL-6 and uh, TNF-alpha, you uh, had a higher occurrence of death here. Unfortunately, IL-8 uh, disappeared in this particular model, likely because it was eclipsed by stronger predictive markers uh, that followed the same pattern, and uh, such as, I don't know, D-dimer or CRP. And importantly, IL-6 and TNF-alpha was therefore really significantly associated with worse survival independently of all these other severity metrics. So we can add the value, and even if you stratify by things like oxygen saturation, age group, or by severity scoring, uh, using either our severity scoring or the SOFA scoring, which is an internationally recognized score for uh, patients in the ICU, you can still see that there is a uh, independent uh, value for uh, TNF alpha and IL-6. And in some cases, uh, even IL-8 comes back if you take into account the certification for, for scoring. So there's uh, uh, clearly additive value in measuring these cytokines uh, in these patients that we think should be really considered within the clinic for not only predicting outcome, but potentially stratifying patients for what are the best therapies for them to receive. You know, if patients start out with the highest degrees of IL-6, you know they will do more poorly and maybe they should be treated differently from those that have lower IL-6 and same for TNF-alpha as well. So this is showing, in other words, the same data where uh, you can see that the levels of high IL-6 in red or high TNF alpha in red uh, in the bottom uh, are significantly uh, associated with worse survival in both patients with normal oxygen saturation level versus those with hypoxia. And the same with patients within the moderate and very severe disease. You can still distinguish the two. Uh, so it's, it's really a useful marker independently of, of these uh, other severity metrics. Uh, we also confirmed all these findings in a second cohort that was accrued from April until June, uh, where 231 patients were tested SARS-CoV-2 positive, and we applied the models either with just using demographics and comorbidities or by including all these other labs and looked at it, projected it over time from the test to the follow-up, and we could see that it always performed better than by random chance, which would be 0.5, uh, and we could basically over 20 days of follow-up, uh, predict the outcome based on our models, and there was a good uh, overlap between the original and validation cord all the way to day 20. After 20 days in the clinic, it's a little bit, uh, in the hospital, it's a little bit uh, harder to, to make these predictions. But overall, this model holds up uh, over time as well in a, in a separate uh, independent validation cord. So the next thing is like, how does this, uh, how do the cytokine change with time? We we're interested to see whether there were any changes over time. And only in the subset of patients here, we had cytokines measured more than once. And what was interesting to see is that on average, these patients started higher for cytokines, but they didn't really change all that much over time. They remained high even after 15 days of uh, original hospitalization. So the question is, can we still affect these cytokines somehow by treatment? And here is showing these three cytokines that were most informative in relation to the start of the treatments such as tocilizumab, which is an anti-IL-6 receptor, where we see IL-6 levels shoot up because we're basically preventing IL-6 from being metabolized by the cells. And this is something observed in other patients as well, but it actually helps the patient, even though the IL-6 level is higher, it just cannot signal because it's blocked by tocilizumab. While TNF-alpha may be slightly decreasing with uh, IL-6 also with remdesivir, and interestingly, dexamethasone on the right, uh, which is uh, known to um, be beneficial, beneficial for patients with the most severe disease, uh, 
it may be potentially uh, due to uh, this really strong reduction we see in IL-6 after treatment with dexamethasone. So we really propose that not only should we look at these um, cytokines, in particular IL-6 and TNF-alpha, early upon admission for their prognostic value, but stratify treatment based on these cytokines and consider potential anti-cytokine treatments again, this type uh, by guided uh, by the cytokine levels, and especially with combinations of, let's say, IL-6 and TNF-alpha, which haven't really been tried. And so in the next few slides, I'm already running a little bit late, so I'm trying to go a little bit faster. Uh, we will try to see if we can now get better sense of which other cytokines could be useful. Here, we really had a hypothesis-driven uh, question on the four cytokines we selected, but maybe there are others that could be even uh, equally or more informative than IL-6 and TNF-alpha. And we use these other methodologies like O-Link to, to look for that and also mention the antibodies. And so from now on, I will uh, talk about a prospectively co uh, pr um, collected cord. And this was really due to heroic efforts from a huge team of volunteers led by Miriam Mirad and Alex Charney uh, and uh, Kim, Sun Ki Kim Schultz at the Immune Monitoring Center. And they were there during the whole epidemic to produce these tubes and labels to go to the clinic, gown up, uh, process the samples in BSL-2 plus environment. It was really very tedious and time consuming, but they made uh, this most amazing effort, which allowed us within just over a month to collect 500 samples from pa 500 patients uh, hospitalized with COVID-19 and another 200 controls that were hospitalized without COVID-19 as well as healthy controlled and patients with undergoing clinical trial that were collected serially every day in the beginning and then every three days later on when we decided it was probably not necessary to do it that often for blood, whole blood collection, serum collection, RNA, and as well as full demographic information. So we ended up with more patients probably collected than any grants uh, that's usually over a five-year period within just a month, so 700 patients, where we could apply out each one of these tubes for assays such as cytoph phenotyping, a mass cytometry for looking at the function and phenotype of the blood, antibody titers that I'll mention in a second, RNA-seq profiles from blood, and statistical correlation analysis. So one of the assays that we've performed is called O-Link, which is uh, basically a soluble analyte multiplex platform that can measure in 92 assays at once with a high dynamic range. We had a lot of experience thanks to uh, previous uh, networks we were part of to use this methodology. And we used uh, uh, this test and basically tested every specimen from the 500 patients we had and uh, uh, see whether they were able to fall in different clusters. And on the top left, Along the y-axis are the serum specimen, and the x-axis is the actual cytokines. And you can see there are 18 different clusters that could be formed. And on the right side is the averaging of the individual analytes in these clusters. And you can see that they fall also into maybe several categories. And we could confirm, for example, that patients here with a high IL-6, TNF-alpha seem to belong together more often compared to the other patients. And if you look at it and how it's associated with severity, on the bottom right, you can see that uh, these uh, big clusters, uh, the first one here in green with the high L6 and TNF alpha is, as we saw before, associated with worse survival, more of the black bars that mean disease patients and very high severity, while other uh, of these clusters are associated with uh, uh, more moderate disease and even healthy uh, profiles, and some just more severe. So this will be now very important for us to use as a signature, but also to potentially pick out what would be the next best cytokine to include in our panel. And we're currently working on this. And to finish up, I also wanted to let you know about our work to measure uh, antibody responses in these patients as well from the prospective cohort. So we were lucky enough to have access early on to SARS-CoV-2 antigen in collaboration with our colleague Florian Kramer, who was the one of the first ones to describe an ELISA test for uh, SARS-CoV-2 at Mount Sinai. And uh, we obtained the SARS-CoV-2 uh, S-spike protein from him, as well as from uh, collaborators at Einstein College of Medicine in New York, as well as uh, collaboration with Alex Rubinstein for a series of overlapping peptides from the S-spike covering this receptor binding domain that uh, binds to ACE2. And uh, we, uh, uh, use these as a as high throughput ELISA that was developed in my lab for cancer antigen, uh, looking at antibody responses and basically adapted it for uh, 
uh, the uh, COV2 antigens. And we benchmarked it to the clinical test and we saw there was good correlation. If anything, our test was actually potentially more sensitive. We could, we could detect titers up to uh, close to 100,000 while the clinical lab is capped at 2,800. And we even saw a few patients that were potentially missed by the other tests as well. And uh, reproducibility was very good. And we tested all these antigens with a series of isotype and subclasses systematically, IgG, IgA, IgM, IgG1, 2, 3, as well as the peptide pool. This is an example of a patient and how when they come in the hospital, they actually, in this case, had already detectable antibody titers for IgG, which increase over time of hospitalization. And you can see this is mostly driven by IgG1 and IgG3 with not much IgG2. And new epitopes appear against this peptide pool of the RBD domain uh, as the patient uh, continues to stay in the hospital. And so you see this broadening of the repertoire. And if you now look overall in all the patients, we start out with 263 specimens here that were averaged for the titers. And in the blue line on top, you can see that almost everyone, when they enter the hospital, they already have detectable titers. So it's really re remarkable that uh, the, 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 these patients are probably have been infected for at least five or seven days. They had the time to mount the antibody response, but while they're in the hospital, their titers continue to increase and diversify as well. If you compare that to the convalescent patients, these titers are slightly higher, but importantly, it should be noted that so far, we have one patient who is now five months out of their uh, uh, disease. These are patients who didn't have a hospitalization, and we still see titers that are maintained, which is quite reassuring. So there's not a loss of antibodies so far that we could detect in these patients, and most patients appear high in the beginning. Uh, the antibody subtypes and isoty isotypes and subclasses tend to correlate with each other, especially when you test against the same protein, but less so when you test against uh, peptides. And so what are the associations with uh, these antibodies with severity? Uh, if we look here, comparing healthy donors on the bottom, uh, non-COVID, to convalescents that were never hospitalized in orange versus um, in pink patients uh, that are pediatric with this uh, Kawasaki-like syndrome, and then patients who are hospitalized with uh, a variety of different uh, severity, uh, we can see that Antibodies are quite high for IgG with a median titer of 5,000 and moderate, but even more significantly higher in patients, uh, significantly higher in patients with severe and severe end organ damage for IgG, IgA, IgG1, and IgG3. Uh, very few patients had IgG2, but they were significantly there in some and reproducible. So we can see that uh, there is this association between the maximum titer achieved and the maximum severity which is in part potentially due to the fact that the patients who are more severe stay longer in the hospital and therefore have higher titers. But even if we only take into account patients at the first time point measured when they enter the hospital, we can still see that there is a, a significantly higher uh, association with severity of disease, which we're not the first to show. I've seen already presentations say the same thing, but it asks, begs the question, like, why are antibodies not helping? Why are they, in this case, potentially contributing in some ways to severity. And we still don't have a good answer for that, but we're pursuing a lot of different hypotheses and trying to see whether maybe they're uh, during the peak of inflammation with the cytokines that we mentioned, contributing further to inflammation themselves by creating things like immune complexes and other things, or uh, maybe they're also simply a marker of higher viral loads that was exposed and therefore more antibodies that we have to measure. So I'll skip over the peptide response, but one thing I wanted to point out is that there are still a small but significant percent of population that even when you measure it over all this time in the hospital remain antibody negative, and it ranges for four to 12%, depending on the isotype and cytokine, uh, antibody that you're looking at. And if you look at those patients with the low titers or negative titers for IgG or IgA, you can see that, uh, sorry, this should be IgM. Uh, this is a, a mistake here. You can see that these patients who lack an antibody response uh, are doing significantly worse. And this is independent apparently of tire of uh, age and sex. You can see that uh, independently of that. So this is something where in, it goes a little bit against what I was just saying, where having the antibodies is probably still necessary in order to control the virus. But if you have too many of them, it may not be good. While if you don't have any, it's really bad. And uh, the last thing is what we're currently doing, trying to compare antibody uh, titers uh, 
with the measurements from O-Link as well as other comorbidities and see whether there are things that seem to belong together. And we can see that the higher titers tend to have more inflammatory cytokines that are neutrophil related, like these chemokines, CCL3, 4, while they tend to be anti-correlated with interferon gamma, which may uh, sort of suggest that the higher the antibodies may be, it could potentially be at the expense of a T-cell cytotoxic response. And that would be a type of old TH1, TH2 paradigm that uh, could be potentially there, but we still have to explore further. And so part of the future exploration is understanding serological profile in greater depth. And so we have peptide arrays where we can map potentially the areas of uh, the virus that seem to be the most immunogenic beyond just the S spike protein, as well as look at all the other autoantibodies that are generated in the um, uh, patients using these human protein arrays. And we apply that to these uh, pediatric patients to try to understand whether maybe that could be a, a causative link between the reactivity to the virus and autoantigens that's causing these inflammatory responses in these in these kids. So finally, I just want to thank all my collaborators, in particular Diane Del Valle, who was instrumental in gathering all the data and analyzing it for the cytokines uh, with the ELA instrument, together with Sung Hee, who really pioneered these uh, methodologies, and our myeloma group all the clinicians who helped in interpreting the data, as well as the statisticians, uh, he, uh, Vivian Huang, uh, the pathology department, uh, Effie Konigsberg, Stephen Chan, Nick Fernandez for the O-Link analysis, and Vanessa and Kevin Tubales for the uh, antibody data together with Dushan, and of course, Miriam Merad and all our funding. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Sasha, for really a comprehensive lecture. Um, you had many, many questions. In fact, very, very interesting questions. So I'm going to try to go to group them and, and go through them uh, as much as I can. So the first question um, was about the role of interferon uh, in COVID-19. I don't think you mentioned anything about interferon, but the question was whether uh, interferon does play a role uh, and why there is interferon treatment. Short, short answers because we have many questions to go through. Yeah, I mean, interferon is definitely uh, an interesting uh, cytokine, and I regret a little bit it was not decided to be uh, measured in some of our panels early on because it tends to have, a, in particular for interferon gamma, a very dynamic profile uh, related to inflammation. Interferon uh, type 1 are a little bit harder to measure so far in the test, but we're considering them, and they are part now of the O-Link panel that we're analyzing. And we can see clearly that you know they, they delineate specific uh, categories of, uh, of cytokines they're associated with uh, profiles and fall within some of these clusters. Uh, in terms of like the interferon treatment in these patients and how it could potentially uh, modulate the, the virus itself, this is something I think we, we have yet to explore, but uh, maybe Miriam, you have also yourself. There. Yeah. No, yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's still, uh, you know, being explored. We don't have much time, unfortunately, to uh, discuss this. So, so let's let's move on. Uh, one question was: Do you believe whether ELA is the best method to measure cytokine? I mean, we liked ELA in this case because it's uh, fast within three hours, and I'm really impressed by the reproducibility. But I, I don't think it's necessarily the best and only method. There's clearly now a test that was approved actually by the FDA that's IL-6 related that uh, will be uh, something that uh, needs to be taken into account. Uh, the important thing is to make sure the reproducibility is there, especially if it's a clinical test, and decide on the, on the dynamic range to make sure that it, it, it fits. But I don't think it's uh, exclusive to one platform only, no. Yeah. So uh, do you think that COVID-19 is really fueled, at least in severe patients, by a cytokine storm? That would be one of our main hypotheses, that indeed there's uh, this unusual level of cytokines that are there from the early days. And even more surprisingly, once you create these antibodies, which you would think should start getting rid of the virus or controlling it at least, this inflammation, as I mentioned in the plots with IL-6 over time, remains high for the cytokines. And so what is maintaining this uh, cytokine levels over such a long time is a, a bit of a mystery, and it does seem to be potentially uh, related to uh, a response to the host rather than of the virus itself uh, that's somehow become self-sustained over time. And so 
it's an important thing to measure, right? Uh, then there are a lot of questions about predictive markers. So whether IL-6 uh, is a good predictive marker uh, of, of COVID severity. Have you looked at the combined uh, uh, potential uh, or uh, predictiveness of IL-6, IL-8, and TNF as a better predictive marker of, of, mor of morbidity and mortality? Yeah, so this is, uh, I may have gone a bit fast. So we first looked individually at each cytokine and how they're uh, associated with survival. Indeed, IL-6, IL-8, all independently are associated with worse survival. But in the last models where we take into account all the other uh, markers of uh, severity and comorbidities, we have all cytokines together in the model. So they really are uh, still predictive independently of each other. So they, they, they are useful together, but they still are necessary independently of each other. Yeah, uh, and then there is a lot of questions about uh, should we use CNF inhibitors uh, to treat uh, COVID-19? Should we use IL-12 to boost uh, a TH1 response? Can you talk briefly about, you know, I, there's not much data that... Uh, there's not much. I mean, there there's uh, out there quite a few anti-cytokine trials. So the most commonly used has been uh, tocilizumab and cerulimab, which are anti-L6 receptors. I think there is, according to our data, a rationale to test also anti-TNF drugs. And we're currently looking at that also within patients who may be on TNF drugs for other reasons, uh, like uh, inflammatory bowel disease or rheumatoid uh, uh, diseases, to see whether that could potentially uh, see the severity differences in these patients. Uh, and also GMCSF is another trial that's being tested. IL-12, I think, uh, as, a, as a way to in increase uh, could be interesting, but potentially very toxic. So I don't know if it's a good idea to add to the toxicity of these patients uh, while they're having a cytokine storm already. But I think overall, like the anti-cytokines are definitely something to have a second look at, I would think. Yeah. I uh, will just mention, I don't know whether you saw that, Sasha, but there was uh, the phase three IL-6 blockade to see uh, was negative. Uh, I think it came out a few days ago. I still think that we should be very careful in interpreting this data. I think the timing here is very key. At some point, indeed, IL-6 blockade will not be enough. But at an early time point, we have seen some patients that benefited and this is also the, exp the experience of many centers. So I will be, I agree with you that that cytokine blockade should be really looked at very carefully. The problem is doing trials in the context of a pandemic. So then there are many questions about antibody, which I find very interesting. So, so first, I think uh, someone wanted to know whether antibody were measured on the day of hospitalization. Maybe you can clarify that. Yeah, so we for the antibodies, this was all part of this prospectively collected cohort. Typically, we have the first time point on the day or the, just after the day of hospitalization. By the time we get all the information, get the tubes ready to be collected, put them there, they're usually within less than four, 24 hours, the first collection, and then every three days thereafter. And we're doing this now systematically. We're still in the middle of it because there's so many patients uh, sample to be tested. But uh, uh, what I showed you here for survival was taken at the earliest time point, indeed. Then there were questions about whether these antibodies were neutralizing that you measured. That's a very important question, and uh, we haven't yet done the measurement systematically. We have tested in a subset of these patients neutralization, in particular for the pediatrics, and we could see that they are. But uh, if you look at the data from Florian Kramer, our collaborator, he tested the neutralizing capacity in many of these patients according to titer, titer. And basically everybody who was at least one in 360 or 320 above uh, was uh, had neutralizing capacity. And this is also the threshold used to determine whether you can be eligible to donate plasma for convalescent uh, plasma trans transfusion. So it doesn't seem that uh, there is any this functionality of these antibodies once you have a sufficient titer. Well, then uh, there is, uh, 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 I think, a logical question, which is based on your results. Shouldn't we ban treatment with hyperimmune plasma? Or what would be the benefit of hyperimmune plasma? Yeah, I mean, this is the question of causality versus correlation, right? So I'm not sure still whether these antibodies are really causing the worst severity here. Uh, I do think they're important to control the virus, whether uh, an antibody alone will be there, or if it's uh, the antibody contributes uh, in some other ways, I think it's still be determined. So no, I don't think that's uh, uh, enough yet to, to 
to to to go against this uh, this thing. I, I think we we still haven't learned enough about uh, about how the those uh, antibodies really are. Uh, why it's a bit of a paradox why they are associated with more severity and yet they're useful because they should be there to control the virus okay so then uh, just in the 10 last minutes there are several questions about vaccines uh, so the first question was whether vaccine could potentially induce an inflammatory response that could be damaging um i mean if it's a preventive vaccine, which 99% of the vaccines to date are, I don't think so because first the vaccines uh, are typically uh, not there to cause as much of an inflammation as the virus itself. That's the whole point is to basically have a safe thing that will create immunity and should be there to control the virus from entering the cell in the first place. So I think that to, in my sense, I don't see that uh, the vaccine would have any negative effect uh, on the contrary, it should be there to prevent you from having the virus and therefore prevent all the inflammation. So uh, there's some questions about chances of success given the mutability of the virus. Not sure the virus mutates so much, but... Yeah, that's, I think, what you're right. I think so far it's been at least comforting to me to see that, you know, if you look at the mutation rate of the virus over time, there's this amazing website that tracked this over the world. Uh, it's uh, not as quick as some other viruses, in particular flu and others. And so far, there's no evidence of escape that we've seen where, you know, there's a mutation that would prevent uh, the antibodies or other things to, 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 to control it. So uh, to me, at least, uh, the so far it's been encouraging that the durability of antibodies in patients is not as dire as some of the publications have shown so far, at least in a small subset of patients that we could follow for now four months. Uh, and even if the antibody ties go down, I think there will still be a memory B cell response in these patients that could be potentially recalled upon a re exposure. So I, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm not uh, scared yet about the virus uh, mutating to the point that it would not be protected anymore by, uh, by your immune yeah. response. There's a, then an important question Do you think vaccines should more indeed lead, uh, uh, promote an antibody response? or also should seek to induce a T-cell response? That's a great question. And it's one that I don't think we have a great answer for it yet, but uh, uh, there's clearly a, a push to have both. Uh, antibodies make sense because that's how most vaccines work to date. And uh, there is a clear mechanism for them here to prevent the binding to the receptor and entry of the virus. But T cells potentially also address the previous question of mutations and uh, having something that uh, helps getting the sustainability of these antibodies uh, also on the longer term. And so many of the vaccines, including some that are tried, that will be tried locally here by our colleague Nina Bardwaj, are fo focusing enough indeed on the T cell side, uh, if not as much or more so than the antibody side. So. I think a lot of full length approaches could potentially use both, like uh, things like uh, both mRNA and uh, adeno vaccines, which are the currently most advanced one. Uh, there's evidence that these could potentially also lead to hopefully not just antibodies, but I'm, I'm hoping that they could be T cells, but it's possible that having a really T cell focused vaccine could be of interest at this point. Uh, it's still a hypothesis. But. Okay, so then the two last questions, there are many more, but um, I, um, I think we somehow responded, you know, at least thematically to most. But there's one question about uh, um, uh, whether there is any information on biomarkers of the convalescent phase. Uh, I suppose uh, of uh, a healthy convalescent or uh, a clearance of the virus. I think this is what um, you know, the questions mean. That's a great question. I think uh, antibodies could be useful in some ways because I would expect them that over time they should, you know, gradually decrease. And we see that I glossed over it quickly. But if you looked at the data for uh, antibodies, especially IgA, comparing patients with uh, current disease, you know, hospitalized versus convalescence, IgA was the first one to go away quite quickly, and it could be just a representation of the half-life of IgA as well. So whether IgA, uh, which is associated with mucosal immunity, could potentially have more correlation with both severity as well as uh, 
convalescent phase is something that I think I'm kind of very interested in pursuing. And uh, if we see that some of these antibodies come back, for example, in the patient that could be potentially been re-exposed somehow, so that may be like one way to, to track the, the level of exposure in the population potentially. The fact that they all come back also at the same time, that's something also I didn't mention. When we measure these cytokine, the, the antibodies, IgM, IgG, and IgA tend to occur when on those few patients where we catch the circumversion, we catch all three almost simultaneously. There's not really clearly an IgM first followed by IgG and IgA. And so there's a question also of like potentially cross-reactivity between these antibodies versus other previous coronaviruses that is an interesting hypothesis to, to include. And that may also have to be taken into, into account in the long term for for the, the convalescent phase in there. So I think it's uh, something to study for sure. Yeah. So there was a question about what will be the cause of reappearance of symptoms? So that so far, we only have a handful of patients who have yeah. been re-hospitalized. And it's uh, yeah. some patients that we're very interested in, like trying to understand why. Uh, it's possible that at least in a couple of them, they did not mount a sufficient immune response in the first place. Uh, they were part of these patients who remain antibody negative, and we're now catching potentially more antibodies forming in the second phase. Well, but other than those, there are really not that many re patients readmitted, and most of them are readmitted for other reasons than for COVID. Uh, so it's, I don't think it's uh, necessarily something we should expect, and I'm hoping still that the memory response to the virus should be maintained and there, there should be no uh, second uh, reinfection in these patients uh, uh, based on the mutation rate and antibody titers, at least in the short term. Maybe uh, a year from now, we'll have to reevaluate. But for now, it's, there's no evidence that these patients have lost their protection after just a couple of months, unless they didn't have sufficient protection to begin with. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can address the, this last question of should antibody wane? I mean, there is a, it's not formulated this way, but I think it's important to explain you know what we ex like we explain uh, we expect the antibody to to wane at some point so the question is uh, wh what happened if the antibody wane off completely etc yeah i do think it's a normal course if you don't have the pathogen or the virus anymore there's no reason to maintain exactly. the pattern circulation exactly. so eventually you know half life of these antibodies will disappear the memory b cell response that create these antibodies in the plasma cell hopefully is still there and ready to act as soon as the yeah. virus comes so that would be the best thing. So whether it differs by age or by uh, others, that's uh, something I think that's more related to general virology. And we can maybe learn from other viruses to see whether there's anything unique here versus the uh, others. But uh, And maybe vaccines could even have a place in patients who had already uh, been exposed, if this is just as a boost type to, to see. But uh, uh, it, it, that's maybe an alternative for patients who eventually lose the, the virus, the, the antibody titers, and uh, to, to maybe you know bring it back if, if necessary. But uh, I think the the memory uh, should still be there, and it could potentially be measured by other assays than just antibody in the serum, looking at directly B cell and their antibodies on the surface and trying to measure them in circulation. And these are assays we're putting together now so that we can have a sense of the frequency of these cells uh, and not just their ability to produce antibodies. Okay, so I, I think we are uh, done uh, with the lecture and the question sessions, 11 a.m. Thank you very much, Sasha, for uh, really interesting data. I think quite comprehensive or reassessments of the COVID-19 responses. So I'll turn it back to sure. Karina. Thank you so much, Miriam, and thank you, Karina. Thank you for the lecture. Thank you, everyone. So it seems we just say goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.